Hi, that was a great intro. <laughs> Extra comedy points too. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today is book covers and everything authors need to know about them. So I'm hoping somebody has taken care of the slides and you could see them. So if you could, oh, yep, I've just seen mini lecture slides. They're in the channel of mini lecture slides. And so you can see them as I go through them because I have visuals as well. So on to slide two, so the first text one. What are we going to cover in this? Well, what we're going to look at is firstly, how important is the cover to your sales? What's the purpose of a book cover? Who is a book cover for? And most people think it's for the author and that's not um, what it's for. So that's going to be an interesting one. What makes a cover clickable? And then we're going to go into depth on how to research your genre so that you can be more empowered as an author and know what you need on your cover. We're going to go into what are the four different types of covers. And then we're going to look at where to find a professional book cover designer and then how to pick the right one for you, because not all of them are going to be for you. Same as not every book is going to be for every reader. So if you go to the next slide, what we're going to start on is how important is the cover for sales? Well, in short, it's absolutely vital. It's the first interaction potential readers have with your book. And if they aren't attracted to it as they scroll, they're just going to carry on scrolling. So your, your cover is only partly responsible for the actual sale, but it's 100% responsible for getting potential readers to your book sales page. So what this means is a great cover can significantly increase the chances of a sale, while a bad cover will absolutely prevent your sales. The sale itself comes, as I'm sure you all know, from a combination of things that are on your book sales page. Now, what I mean by the book sales page is if someone searched for, say, paranormal romance on Amazon, they come up with a massive long list of different books. They click one and you end up on a page that has the cover um, decent sized, you know, bigger than your thumbnail. And it's got the title, the blurb, the reviews and all that sort of stuff. That is your book sales page. And to buy your book, somebody, and it's going to be different for every reader, but somebody is going to look at things like your cover, your blurb, so what you've just written as a description, your title, your reviews, the author name, your price. They're going to look at your look inside if they click it and see what's inside. Especially on a non-fiction book, they're going to look at the table of contents, but a fiction book, they're going to read the first little bit and see if they like your writing and so on, and the reviews and what other people have said about it. So that's your sales page. And that, in combination of various different things, dependent on the person, is what's going to take, make them buy a book. However, your cover and your name and the title are the only things that get them to that sales page. So that's why your cover is so, so vitally important. And even like in a big long list of search uh, criteria with a bunch of covers, even a big name author, and you know, you're talking the top authors that we've all heard of, even if you don't read that genre, even those big name authors can lose a sale if the cover doesn't get its job done and fit its purpose properly. So given all that, your cover is absolutely vital to your book sales. So we go to the next slide. What's the purpose of a book cover? Well, to put it in a nutshell, your cover is a marketing image that tells readers what sort of story is behind it. It attracts the right readers and it repels the wrong, the wrong ones, the ones who won't like your story. And at the end of the day, it's what stops readers, the right readers, from scrolling and gets them to click and go to your sales page. So let's unpack this a little bit. Most newer authors think their cover has to represent their exact story. I know I did back when I was an author. I thought I had to have every tiny little detail on there. This actually isn't what a cover is for. So as you can see, it's literally it's a marketing image, just like a movie poster is. 
You don't need it to convey everything that happens in your story or even one specific scene of your story. What it needs to do as clearly as it possibly can is convey the genre and the type of story you have. Now this is where you get into things that are called cover tropes. And I'm sure as writers you all know what tropes are when you're writing. Well, when you get to covers, they have the same thing. They have tropes. Readers know exactly what the covers of stories they like look like. And they know that unconsciously because of these tropes. So let's take an example. If you've got uh, a reader who loves reading about shifter books, what are they going to expect on the cover? Well, the tropes for that might be, if it's a wolf shifter, there'll be a moon. There'll be... Uh, a fair amount of darkness because well it's at night uh, there might be claws there might be fur there might be fangs um, there's usually a person and yes as someone said wolves um, if it's got um, reverse harem elements into it it's usually got multiple wolves rather than just one so you can tell just by looking at the cover what type of story it is and if you like shift stories you know that cover is for you and the book is going to be one you enjoy. So when you then come to the opposite of it, the next thing is your book is not for everyone. Now, no book is for everyone. And I learned this recently. Not even Harry Potter is for everyone. My mum won't read it because she doesn't like magic. I can't understand that, but there you go. So not every book is for everyone. So you need to get your cover to show the wrong people that this book is not for them. Let's say you've got a story that's got, say, high steam romance in it. You're not going to want to attract people with your cover who are looking for a fade to black, low steam story because they're not only going to fail to enjoy it, they're going to complain about how much they didn't enjoy it in your reviews. So you want to push those people away from clicking on your cover. So that's kind of like the dual purpose. You want to attract the people who will enjoy it and repel the people who won't enjoy that. And to do that, you need to have the correct cover tropes and avoid having the incorrect ones at the same time. So that's what a purpose of a book cover is. So if we go to the next slide, who is your cover for? And this is the big sticking point I get a lot. It's not for the author. You already own the book. You don't need to buy it. It's not going to make you search for it and then click because you like the cover. It's also not for your existing fans. They're going to buy your book because they like the way you write and the type of stories you write, or this is books two, three, four, five, whatever it is, and they want to finish the series. And yes, as someone said, this is a very hard truth for someone. Who your cover is for is for your potential readers who would enjoy your story, who've not heard of you before, and therefore will base their decision to do that click solely on your cover. So while as an author, yes, you want to like your cover, I don't want you hating your cover, but you have to remember what its purpose is and who it's for. And the same with your fans. To them, your cover is a piece of fan art, but that isn't what's going to sell your book. And as, a, as an aside, this is a massive reason why you shouldn't be getting feedback from your fans when you get cover mock-ups done. Because unless they understand the purpose of a cover and how tropes work, their feedback is going to end up steering you in the wrong direction if you're not careful. So, Potential readers, this is who your cover is for. They know nothing about you. They don't know your stories. They don't know your writing styles. They're the ones who are going to click based on whether they like your cover or don't like their cover. You want them to be attracted to it because they're the ones who are going to grow your fan base, get you sales you wouldn't otherwise have had, and take you closer to your goals as an author. So that is why you need to get the correct cover tropes on there and appeal to the potential readers and not worry too much about whether your fans love it or don't love it because they're going to buy it based on your name. So, next slide. What makes a cover clickable? Okay, so a clean thumbnail 
you can see at thumbnail size what's on the cover, obvious genre cues meets the genre expectations, and it works in black and white. So let's go into that in a bit more detail. A thumbnail, this is what you get when you go on someone like Amazon and you search for something and all the covers are tiny, um, like you know, a couple of inches tall. That is what's called a thumbnail. That is the, the size that people first encounter your book. Now, if they can't tell what's going on at that size, they're going to get confused and a confused person doesn't click. So it has to be clean and you can see there's characters on there. You can see what characters are what they're interacting. You can see the silhouette of the character, usually sort of like waist up, any weapons they're holding, anything like that. You have to be able to tell what is going on, not is that like that characters or is that a part of a tree because again that's going to confuse them it's got to be clean which means limiting what you have on your covers and not trying to throw everything on there because it's in your story so that's what i mean by a clean thumbnail obvious genre cues meets genre expectations these are your cover tropes if you've got a wolf shifter story put a wolf on it put a moon on it like we've already said the other thing is works in black and white. Now, a lot of people seem to get surprised by this, but there are people like me who read on a paper white and everything is in black and white. And at the end of the book, I'll be shown by Amazon, three, four, whatever it is, nice little thumbnails of books that I might want to read now I've finished reading this story. They're all in black and white because that's what a paper white shows you. So if I can't tell in black and white, what is on your cover at a thumbnail, I'm not going to click it. So you've got to not only have a thumbnail that works in color, you actually have to have it in black and white. And what's behind that is something called value contrast. You've got in colors, you have the color, so yellow, purple, green, whatever it is, but you have values of that color. So how dark it is and so on. And you want those values to show you what is important on the cover to take the person looking at its focus to the focal point, just as well as you want the colors to take that person to the focal point. And so that's why your cover needs to work in black and white. So we go to the next slide. So we're gonna look at how to research your genre. Now this is the single biggest thing you can do as an author to work with a cover designer is to understand the cover requirements in your genre. What we're gonna look at is five things. We're gonna look at the types of covers, and this will become clear, I've got a slide for each. The types of covers that are in your genre and selling in your genre, not just in it right at the bottom of the, the genre, but actually the ones on the bestseller lists that are selling. We're going to look at the art styles in your genre. We're going to look at the color palette. We're going to look at the topography, which is the text. And I mean title and author name, the whole text. And we're going to look at the image content and genre cues. Because these are the five things that you need to know about your genre and what is selling books in your genre. This way, you can go to a professional cover designer who maybe doesn't know that genre and you know exactly what you need to be getting on your cover. And you can go to a professional designer who does understand it and they'll appreciate it because they know it's exactly the same thing, what needs to be on that cover. And either, either way, at the end of the day, you're going to get a cover that's going to work to sell books in your genre. Now, these five things are... Another thing about the genre is these five things come in different orders of importance. So sometimes the type of cover is the most important thing. Sometimes the art style is the most important thing. So you'll not only want to know what of those five things in your genre work, but you'll need to know which are the most important because those ones you have to nail. And the ones that are the least important, those are the ones that you can you can miss if you want to, like the fifth most important one. You can change slightly just to make it look slightly different if you want, but you have to nail that first.
first, well, the first four. And if you really want to stand out, you nail the first all five. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to be looking at book cover types. Now, there's four different types of book covers. There's character-focused covers. There's setting-focused covers. There's symbol or object-focused covers. And there are topography covers. As you can see, the first one, character-focused covers, they have characters on, uh, people. Uh, sometimes they'll have like, you know, wolves, monsters, whatever it is for, um, you know, your genre, ogres, whatever. Um, but they will have characters on and they're typically, as you can see, they are, they are a certain size and they, they vary from being able to see the whole character right through to being zoomed in enough to just show like head and maybe shoulders kind of thing. And again, that's one of the things you'll be looking at. But these are character covers. The next one, setting focus covers. Now, as you can see here, just at the bottom, there's some tiny little characters. Setting focus covers focus on the environment. So you're seeing this beautiful scene environment. And there's a tiny little stick figure kind of thing that shows you that, yes, this is a massive scene. Uh, these are typically in things like um, epic fantasy, because you can see the epicness of the landscape. So that's a setting focus cover. Symbol or object focus covers. These are where there's no people. It's an object, as you can see here, a jar. Um, they can be in a scene like this one is. It's a jar sitting in some uh, grass on a beach. Or they could be just sort of an object in black nothingness. It, it doesn't matter. As long as there's an object that is the, the focal point of the cover, that makes it an object or a symbol cover. Lastly, we've got topography covers. Now here, this is because the title is actually the sole focus of everything. It is the artwork. In this case, there is an object in it as well, but it's not the focus. The focus is that topography. And in this, the topography, the title, will be pretty much the entire cover. And for these, if you want one of these, my advice would be, have a nice long title because that makes it a lot easier to, to fill up the whole page <laughs> but um, this is where the, literally the topography everything interacts with that title so as you can see here the sword is interacting with it the flames are interacting with it the cut the title words themselves interact with each other that is what makes a topography cover so if we go to the next slide art style so this is an, the second thing that you want to look at for what sells in your genre. Now we've got photo manipulation, we've got 3D modeling, we've got full illustration, and we have a combination of all of those three or two of those three, okay? So do the covers in your genre, are they photo manipulation? Like this first one, these were real people and they've actually had a head swap because I didn't like the heads on one of them, but that's immaterial. They are photos. So they have a very, very different look to 3D and full illustration, as you can see from the others. Um, so what is selling in your genre? Is it photo manipulation covers? The 3D modeling, there are programs like Daz or Blender, and there's a whole host of others where you can create 3D models, and this person in this one is completely 3D models. Um, so it's come out the program looking like that. Yes, there's paint on top, but that's what it looks like. So you can tell from the face it's a 3D model face. It's not a photo face. Um, so if that is what sells in your genre, then that's what you need to do. Then there's the full illustration. This was, you know, blank white piece of paper, completely custom done for the author. Uh, and this is done by an artist called Ming Luke, um, who's a fantastic illustrator. He did that one. He's allowed me to put this up. So thank you, Ming. Um, and this, again, some genres will require full illustration if you want to be at the top of that genre. And they cost more, but that's the way it is. 
Um, and then lastly, you've got a combination. So in this one, I have photos, faces, I have 3D model bodies and weapons. Um, I have photo uh, trees, I have 3D model trees, and then I've painted over the whole top. So you kind of get a combination, but you get that feeling that the faces are photos, so that would fit if it's photo manipulation. And you could just not have the faces done uh, with head swaps, as it's called, uh, if you wanted the more 3D look and so on. So they're the three different or four different art styles. And you need to know in your genre, what is it that you need? Now, in contemporary romance, it's pretty much always photos. Whereas if you go to something like lit RPG or um, middle grade fiction, it's largely, if not exclusively, um, full illustration. So you have to know what what works in your genre um, and another one actually and I didn't put it in here cozies um, they need vector art sometimes uh, rom-coms they need vector uh, photo manipulation so know what art style sells in your genre um, and I just have a question here I'm trying to figure out how to word this when you determine what type of cover that you're going for, how much room for experimentation is there, like the tropes, but also adding elements that may not jive with what's going on in your genre. Um, that let's let's come back to that actually in the questions section. Um, the type of cover you want to stick with the genre tropes, as we've said, um, you will sell more if you hit the tropes right because you are attracting people who don't know you, um, and. The type of cover, there's, go, there's always going to be a range. Covers, trends change as you go. So, um, that's, yeah, let's come back to that. Sorry, getting sidetracked. Okay, so art style. Know the art style. Uh, the same with the cover style. Know the type of cover you want for your genre, but there is room for experimentation. Like I said, if it is the fifth most important thing, if it's the first most important thing there is zero room for experimentation so next slide color palette now what colors do you commonly see in the covers that are selling in your genre is it super saturated if so where is it super saturated is it desaturated if so again where so as we can see here you've got the first one is highly saturated it looks like it's sort of glowing almost because it's like that rich purple and the rich gold and it's it's very very saturated now some genres like as the case of this cover paranormal women's fiction they are very very saturated they're very colorful um and so do you need that in the genre that you write in that's what you're looking for then you get um this one which is a vampire paranormal romance now, vampire covers typically are red, very bright blood red, and completely desaturated backgrounds. There's a trend to get some blue in there as well, so you'll see vampire covers that are red, desaturated, and have some sort of pale blue, cyan blue kind of thing in the background. But you'll be able to tell when you start looking at the covers of what's selling, you'll be able to see this trend now you know you're looking for it. So this one is desaturated, except for the reds, which are very, very obvious and very blood red for a vampire cover. And other genres will have the same thing. There'll be colors that you see more of than other colors. And then you get the more desaturated ones. So yes, there's golds and blues in here, but it's mostly desaturated. There's not a huge pop of color. It's all about the value of the color as to what's drawing your eye, what's light, what's dark, and things. So is your genre that you write in desaturated? If so, is that an important thing that you need to know? Is that one of the most important things? Like if you have a vampire story, everything else pales behind the fact that you have to get this color scheme correct, because that is what sells a vampire cover, is desaturated red and now with some blue as well. So work out what your color palette is for your genre and whether it's the most important thing in your genre or not. So on to the next slide. The topography. This is all the text. 
So we've got lots of different things to look at. We've got things called serif fonts. We've got sans serif fonts. We've got script fonts. We've got swirls, alternates, or versus plain fonts. We've got to know where the font is, the location of it, and the font treatment. So we'll start with plain serif fonts. So serif fonts are, I'm sure you've seen them, they've got those sort of little um, tails, if you like, over the ends of the letters. So at the edges, it sort of like juts out. Uh, Times New Roman is a very, very, very common serif font. So if you've got Word or something, go look at Times New Roman, you'll see what I mean. It's got little extra ed end bits. <laughs> then you get the sans serif fonts, and these are your typical uh, sci-fi fonts. Um, coattails, thank you. Yes, that's a great way of doing it. So you've got your sans serif fonts, and these are the ones without the coattails. Uh, sans means uh, sorry, sans serif, without serif in French. So you've got um, no coattails. <laughs> it's just you go from thin like this one to super blocky, but there's no like extra little bits. So which of these two does your genre have on the covers? Is it serif fonts or sans serif fonts? After that, you start getting into the more details. So you've got, as you can see here, swirly serif fonts. So you've got the curls, the, the extra bits, the alternates, as they're called in the fonts, the, um, the glyphs, all of that sort of stuff. And this, this um, swirly stuff shows you it's kind of romantic. It's sort of pretty romantic. You're not going to get it on a hard, gritty story. So as you can see, just looking at it, the feel of it, it's going to be the more pretty, flowery, romantic stories. So you'll see those there. So again, does your genre have those? And then you get to the next one. So is in your genre, is it uppercase like the other three? Or is it lowercase like this one? Because that's going to be an important thing in your genre. Is it is case important or not? If it isn't, if you're seeing, you know, 50-50 mix, then, you know, pick which one you like. But if you're seeing all of them go lowercase or all of them go uppercase, then you need to stick with what they do in your genre that are selling books. Now, for location, is it like the last cover where the title is at the top? Or is it like the others where the title's at the bottom? Because, again, some genres, it's... Uh, you know, it's a standard. Um, like if you've got a, a man chest cover, well, you can't very well put the title at the top or it'd be over the person's face. So you have to put it at the bottom. Um, typically in uh, paranormal women's fiction, like this one, you'll see it at the top because the objects are there and they're typically on the ground doing something and therefore they're usually, you don't have room to put the text in there. So it might be a what your genre requires. It might be a simple, well, it doesn't fit anywhere else. Um, but have a look and see what your genre does. Now, what I mean by treatment is the last point, is um, the text styles. So as you can see in the first cover, it kind of looks silvery, metallic-y. Now, there are some genres like urban fantasy. They almost always have metallic text. So that means you need metallic text if you write urban fantasy. Um, the second one is kind of glowy with a flare, a lens flare. It's very sci-fi. So again, what sort of layer styles and things um, are in your genre? What does it look like? Does it look metallic? Does it look plain? Does it, um, is it always one color? Uh, does it have like gradients on it? Does it have effects like the um, sci-fi one? Does it... Um, have highlights, um, all sorts of things. Have a look and see what in your genre it has. Then you know what you need on your cover. So, and I will come back to questions. Um, so, next slide. We're going to look now at the image content and the genre cues. So, these cover tropes. So, what we need to look for is the environment. Is it a city? Is it a forest? Does it have a moon, etc.? What is going on? What magic or weapons are, you know, in the covers in your genre? What outfits or lack thereof um, are in the genre? 
how much of the character shows. So like the first one, you're pretty much seeing her from the ankles up, whereas the second one, you're seeing just his chest and so on. So what proportion of the character shows? Are there any animals? If so, how many? How many characters are there? What poses do they have? Uh, what races do the characters have? You know, elf, orc, fairy, angel, etc. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that you need to examine your genre for with the covers that are selling. So if we take the first one, and we look at the background, it's clearly an urban fantasy because there in the background is a nighttime city. It's also clearly a wolf shifter urban fantasy because, hey presto, there's a wolf. And it's got magic in it because the sword is lit up and again you've got the moon behind her so again shifter so you can see those cover tropes starting to tell you what story is going to go on behind this cover and whether you would like that book or not um, uh, the second one the proportions like i said have a look at how much of the character is showing uh, when it comes to man chest it's quite typical to cut them off at the bottom of the nose um, and so that leaves the reader a chance to use their imagination and imagine how the, the male main character looks. Um, it's not always the way, but it is quite common. Um, so what is it in your genre? How much the character needs to show? Um, if it's dark fantasy, quite often they'll be mid-thigh up and so on. It's one of the big things for dark fantasy. Um, so the next one you get, and I mentioned this earlier, is animals and a number of them this this cover as you can see is a reverse harem because there's a girl and three wolves so you know it's not just your average wolf shifter there's not just one wolf like the first cover there's multiple so there's a harem kind of thing going on and with the girl showing it's typically reverse harem because she's the main character but again you've got like your typical wolf stuff going on so you know it's a shifter cover you've got you know the colors showing you that it is nighttime uh, you've got the wolves and so on um, you've got the little bits of swirlies in the topography to show you there's some romance going on so you've got to put all of these little things together um, it could be my English accent I might be pronouncing it wrong um, <laughs> with harem harem I don't know um, so anyways, on to the number of characters. Now this, again, this is going to show, uh, for some genres, exactly what the genre is. So in the case of three characters, this shows you whether it's reverse harem or harem stories. So harem stories would be one guy, two girls. Um, but those three characters show you instantly that it's that type of story. Uh, two characters typically depend on their pose will show you whether it's a lovey-dovey story whether it's a high steam story or whether they're perhaps enemies to lovers and they're back to back with you know hidden weapons or whether they just happen to be um, fighting alongside each other and they just happen to be one guy and one girl you know like an epic epic fantasy story with perhaps no romance in it you can tell again from the poses and the number of characters what is going on and what that is telling you about the story behind it so that's the sort of thing you want to look at you want to look at that content of the image what is going on what is it telling you about the stories and what do all the covers that are selling at the top of your genre have in common and you're looking for these commonalities so that's the five things and now you've got to work out which one is most important so you want to take your notes of you know, I want this one for the type of book. Uh, I need this one for um, my art style. Or this one for um, the colors and the saturation. Uh, this is what needs to go on for the topography. And this is what needs to be happening in the image content. Now, I'm looking back at like my hierarchy of what's up there. I've got my bestsellers list up. What is the most important thing? What is the fact, the one thing that they all do? And there will be one thing. Are they all a certain art style? Are they all like the vampire covers, a certain color? Uh, are they all um, having a certain background, like urban fantasy? There will always be a city in the background for urban fantasy. Uh, they are starting, I have to say, to move towards some foresty stuff. But 
you can tell an urban fantasy with the clothing, the modern day clothing, the city in the background and the colouring. That is probably the genre that is the most locked down. So you have to really know what you're doing in urban fantasy um, to nail it. Um, you can't just sort of hope they are they have got very, very strict requirements on what the readers like. Um, but they other genres are a little more sort of like open and say um, say we take cozies I don't design cozies so I don't know huge amounts about cozies but I do know there's a lot of vector art in them and if you try and do something else like say illustration or photo it ceases to look like a cozy whatever your title and content are um, so you've got to for that one nail the art style that's the most important for that one um, and there'll be different ones and again the for paranormal women's fiction that I do a lot it'll be the type of book it's always an object cover because unfortunately as much as I don't like this women over a certain age on a cover don't tend to sell the book um, and paranormal women fiction, women's fiction is about women over the age of 40 um, finding new magic in their life and um, so you need to show the magic and you need to show an object so that is the most important thing. Um, that is what you've got to nail. You can't just sort of go, well, you know, I'll put a cover, uh, I'll put a character on there because that isn't going to work. It's then not going to look like um, paranormal women's fiction. Um, the one thing that you can experiment between is a symbol cover and a topography cover because most people don't know the difference and so they are slightly interchangeable. And having just done one for one of the Fab 13 who created Paranormal Women's Fiction, we've actually done her a topography cover instead of a symbol cover. And uh, so far it's still in pre-order, so we don't know about sales, but that's what she wanted. So, <laughs> um, But it still looks like Paranormal Women's Fiction because we nailed every single other aspect of it. Um, so you can experiment a little but you need to really get, especially as a new author, you need to get the most important four, probably five, absolutely nailed down for what's selling in your genre. So, if we could go to the next slide. How do you go about researching your genre? Well, you know what you need to look for. Now you need to know where to look. So Amazon bestseller lists, obviously. Unfortunately, these are starting to get rather polluted because you can put your book in 10 genres and, um, you know, it doesn't always apply to 10 genres. So you'll be looking through, you know, sort of romance section and you've got a lit RPG book coming up and so on. So it's not always the best place to look, but it's a good place to start. Next, you want to look Barnes & Noble for your genre because they're a little more careful about what goes into each genre. The next thing you want to do is go and look at the traditional publishers. Go and look at Orbit and, you know, Penguin and whoever. Um, and look at it for that genre because they tend to be behind indie authors with um, trends because they're slower. It takes them a year to get out a book quite often. So, you know, you can see where the genre was and you can see the tropes that work long term in those. The next thing to do is look on Pinterest. Um, there are lots of Pinterest boards um, and I can point you towards one at the end. The cover designer directory has a whole set of Pinterest boards um, for different genres. So you can see what's in it. Um, and lastly, the big authors in your genre. They're the people that you need to follow and look at what they're coming out with. Look at their pre-orders. That's what's coming next in your genre um, because they're the trendsetters in your genre. They have the big enough name, the big enough following that they can deviate from these five things and still get sales. And they are going to be the ones that trendset because when they do something different, suddenly all the pre-maids go, oh, that's what's happening. I'll create a pre-made that does that. And so all the next lot of authors buy those and they're the ones that come out um, shortly afterwards. So that's how you can see the trends that are coming in your genre and that's where you need to look and you want to be doing your homework and going looking for these things in these places. So on to the next one. 
where do you find a professional book cover designer? Well, Discord, since we're already here. I've, I'm one of the admins at the Book Cover Market server, and it's paired with you guys, so it's in your um, pairing um, channel, and I'm sure the admins will put that in there. So come join us. We have loads of different designers on there and loads of different places, sort of channels and that you can go and see. Thank you. You can go and see different pre-mades you can buy. You can go and see who's available for customs, the whole works. So that's a great place. Uh, another place, and this is the big thing for me, online search. You want a professional and a professional should have a website. So therefore they will show up in an online search. So Google, Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, whatever you use, um, search for them. And anyone who's taken their website, uh, their business seriously will have a website. So search for whatever, urban fantasy book cover designer, um, paranormal women's fiction book cover designer, whatever it is, put your genre in there and then add book cover designer. See what comes up, start looking through those websites. Another place you can go, and this is the place that has the Pinterest boards, coverdesignerdirectory.com. Uh, it is owned by somebody who vets all the designers. So they have to be of a certain quality to be in the cover designer directory. And they have to use licensed images, um, which is a massive thing that will stop you getting in trouble. Um, so this is a really good place to look for a quality designer who's been vetted who uses the right um, tools for their business, who's invested in their business, and is going to do you a good cover. Um, so that's where to find it. Um, next slide. How to pick the right one for you. So wherever you come from, Discord, Cover Designer Directory, or just straight from Google, have a look at their website. All of them will have a website. If they don't, go on to the next one. They are not a professional because if they can't invest in their business with a website, how do you expect them to make you money by helping you invest in your business? So have a look at their website. Do they have covers in your genre in their portfolio? You know, it's simple. If they don't work in your genre, they're probably not the right designer for you. They might be awesome. They might be the top of their genre. But if they don't work in your genre, then try a different cover designer. Do they specialize specialize in a limited number of genres? Now, this may sound silly, but to stay on top of all that research that I've gone through, that we do on a weekly, monthly basis for every genre, is nigh on impossible while still trying to work. So you want someone who specializes in a limited number of genres, because then they can stay on top of those trends and know exactly what's going on in the genres. Next thing is, when you're looking at their portfolio, do you like their work? Because if you don't, you're not going to like what they produce for you. So make sure that you actually like what's in their portfolio. Now, in their portfolio, can you see a series? Because most people write in series. Um, but if the designer can't create a series that looks like a series, then again, you know, maybe they're not the designer for you. Now, different genres will have different series requirements. Um, lit RPG books in a series do not look very alike, but that's fine because that's what the series, that's what the genre does. And so you don't expect it. But in something like urban fantasy, they're going to be very obviously a series. So is there a series in your genre, in their portfolio, so you can see that they, they aren't just a one-hit wonder and have created a great pre-made, but they can't follow it up? So next, do they use licensed images and fonts? Now this is a massive one. You should never, and I mean never, get a cover with images that come from something like Pixabay, Pexels, any of these other free sites, or worse yet, just taken off of Google, because it will get you into trouble. I, have, I know people personally from like decades ago who thought they found something on a picture on a free site that was listed as free for use. They put it on their website and Getty Images came after them with a bill for $10,000. They had to hire a lawyer who got it down to $3,000 and they had to pay that $3,000 and the lawyer fee and take the image off their site. Now that is going to happen. At worst, they'll just get your book banned from Amazon, which really isn't 
that good. So never use free images. You always want licensed images and you want to know what you can do with those licenses. So one place that I get them from and a lot of designers get them from is a place called Deposit Photos. There's other places like Shutterstock or um, iPhotos, Big Stock Photo. There's loads of them. If you search for royalty free stock images, you'll find loads of sites. Um, so Deposit Photos have their own license of what you can do with it. You want to be reading that license as well. But as if they have paid for a license from there, it will be a standard license. You know you're covered for a book. So you want to make sure your images are licensed. The same goes with your fonts. If someone has stolen a font, put it on a free site um, and allowed you to download it and use it, you're going to be in trouble. Excuse me one sec. Oh dear. So, <coughs> so you want to have paid fonts. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not good. <coughs> okay. So you want to make sure your your fonts are licensed as well as your images. So the next thing you want to look at is. Of the, for this designer, are there prices within your budget, including other formats? Because most designers like me will try and make it as affordable as possible with a price for an ebook cover. Because most people don't, um, they don't want the audiobook, they don't want the paperback, the hardback, they don't want the hardback from Ingram, etc., etc. They just want the ebook. So most people will price it at just the ebook. But if you're one who wants the paperback and so on, then look up the prices for those and make sure the whole lot is within the budget. Because if it's not, again, they're not the right designer for you. So have a look at that. Then you want to be having a look at their testimonials. Now, obviously, like with anything, they're only going to be the good testimonials up there if they have bad ones. But you can still learn a lot from the testimonials. Have a read of them all. And what's the themes that are coming out? And you'll see, you know, they're, oh, everybody is saying how great the communication is or everyone's saying how good the whatever it is. So that is going to tell you what you're actually going to get. Lastly, once you've got all of that and you think that they are the right designer for you, contact them. Do they get back to you? If they don't, then yeah, move on. <laughs> you know, give them a day. But... Um, you know, they need to get back to you in a timely manner. They are a business. You are a business. Expect to be treated like a business because that's what a professional will do. So contact them and get back to you and go from there. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide. Um, this is who I am. I'm Karen Dimmick of Arkin Covers. I am one of the admins of the Book Cover Market Discord server. I actually specialize in fantasy and paranormal covers. Um, so that's what I do, and you can find me on the book cover market. Uh, if we go to the next server, uh, the next um, slide, sorry, <laughs> next server. So now it's up to questions. Now I've got a bunch of questions that were sent in before, and then I will start looking through the chat <coughs> and hopefully stop coughing. Um, hi. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Perfect. Oh, I'm going to, uh, I'd like to go through the ones I've got already, if that's okay. Hopefully you've got slides for them. Yeah, cool. So I have found, well, I, I got given about 20 questions um, to begin with. So I have grouped them all together. Um, and the first five questions all relate to hiring a professional. So one, should you always hire a cover designer? Uh, my answer is yes, I think so. You have spent a long time writing your book. Why at the very last hurdle would you want to sabotage your chances of people buying it? So professionals are professional for a reason. They're good at quality artwork. They know the genre they work in. They know the cover tropes. They know what will sell your book. And at the end of the day, it's going to get you better results. If, however, there is absolutely no way that you can afford to buy a cover, your next best to, is to DIY it until you can afford to get it redone and recovered, as it's called, professionally. The single worst thing you can do 
is to hire someone super cheap, uh, like Fiverr, somewhere like that, get them to do it, because with that, you run the risk of them stealing artwork, putting unlicensed images on your cover, leaving you having to deal with a book being taken down or the legal consequences of stolen and unlicensed images. And I have seen this more times than I can count. It is not um, pie in the sky. It's happened so many times uh, that I see on Facebook of people complaining that, oh, their cover has you know, been stolen and it was a copy of some famous artwork that they didn't know, but someone else has, but by that stage they've paid for it and so on. So the one thing you can do to lower your cost is to buy a good quality pre-made instead of getting a custom. And if you're starting a series, a pre-made is a great way to go. Pre-mades are usually highly, highly focused on the cover tropes because as a designer, that's what's gonna sell my pre-made to an author if an author knows what they're doing, they know what cover tropes they need. So if I nail the tropes, I have more chance of selling that pre-made and the author has then more chance of selling the book. So pre-mades are a really good, good way to go when you're first starting a series and they're typically cheaper than a custom design. So, you know, it might not match your story exactly, but as we've seen, that doesn't matter. It needs to match the genre expectations. and you know, I, as an author, when my cover came back with brown boots, I changed the color of the boots in the text, you know. <laughs> it's, there's minor little things you can change in the book if you really, really need it to match the cover, but nobody is going to buy your book, read your book, and then come back and complain they want the money back because the cover said the person had blonde hair and she actually had red hair or something like that. It's just not going to happen. So do what's best on the cover for selling the book and let them enjoy the story and go like that. So question two, does the author usually present a very fleshed out idea to a cover artist or should we be giving the artist a lot of freedom and trusting their experience? Well, I've seen it both ways. I've had people come in with a very fleshed out idea and I've had other th others that literally come in and say things like, I want a male character on the cover who's a ranger and it's lit RPG, go for it. So you get the whole range um, of coming to you as a cover designer. Um, having some idea from the author is usually preferable, uh, especially if they've done that research that we went into, because this way I'm more likely to give the author exactly what they were thinking they wanted. Um, so do your research, come to the table with something. However, don't come with a fully fleshed out idea that you're not willing to change because then you are negating all of that designer's experience. They know what works at genre. They know what works in values, in colors. Uh, they know what works in saturation. They know what works in your genre. They know what works at a thumbnail and so on. And you're basically saying, don't do that. Do, do what I want instead. So if you come with a fully fleshed out idea, be flexible. Um, they will probably check in with things along the way. I know I do. I forever sort of like sending all, you know, this is what I've got to, this is what we've get, gotten them to wear, this is, you know, the background scene, um, how do you like it so far, and so on. So they'll check in with you as you go. Um, so give them, give them fairly free reign and you'll probably get asked for feedback along the way. Um, the other thing you can do is if you've got specific photos that you know you like, you know, you found a model on deposit photos or whatever, great. First, make sure they have to be licensed. Don't ask someone to use something that's from Pixabay or Art Breeder or something like that because they're not going to do it if they're a professional. They don't want you to get sued. So um, come with something that has a license they can use. Um, what else? Uh, the other thing is some photos just don't work in photo manipulation and someone who understands photo manipulation will, um, you know, understand that um, and someone who's just thinking that's a nice pretty picture may not. Um, so be flexible. Even if you come with exactly what you want, be flexible and lean on your designer for their experience. That's why they're professional. Um, so question three, is there a general rule of thumb for cost, especially for eBooks? Um, costs, 
pretty much designers tend to package their stuff in different ways. Um, personally, I do it by character, so I'll have one character and then I charge extra for extra characters. I've seen other people um, divide it by the number of stock images being used in a piece. Um, whatever it is, their, their website should tell you how they price. Um, and again, different art styles will cost different amounts. Full illustration is always, uh, unless it's stolen, going to cost more than photo manipulation. So as a ballpark, I would go for around 200 as a minimum for photo manipulation, 3D, some painting over. Average is probably 250 to 450. Um, I have seen designers go as high as 2000 for that. For a fully illustrated, your minimum is probably about 500, and it goes up from there, um, and up and up and up, because there are some incredible illustrators out there. Um, then you've got other formats uh, for like paperback audio, there are additional add ons, they can be uh, 30, 50, 100 dollars, you know, depends on the designer, it should be on their website. Uh, pre made are cheaper, they're almost always photo manipulation 3D and some illustration, you will very, very, very rarely find a fully illustrated uh, pre-made because it takes a long time to do and if somebody doesn't like something, um, it's almost impossible to change. So pre-mades range from say 150 to, I've seen them up to a thousand for something that will sell your book. Um, you know, you can get pre-mades for 20 but chances are it won't sell your book. So that's the kind of range you're looking at. Um, question four, how do you generate ideas for a cover? Now I'm assuming you are talking about um, to tell your designer. So go through the research that we've just done. Look at what's selling in your genre, hit the cover tropes, give your designer more free reign if you're really stuck, but do your homework uh, so you know what is gonna sell your book. Question five, is there a trick to finding images related to concepts and abstract ideas? Again, look at the cover tropes, ask your designer if you've got no ideas. Think about objects that are in your story. Um, some genres like dark fantasy have a certain number of objects, snakes, crowns, <laughs> you've seen them, you've probably got as sick as them as everyone else, um, but they're in there and they are become a cover trope. So use them. Um, <laughs> so if we could go to the next slide, the next question is all to do with author brand. Should the author name on the titles of many books by the same author be the same style, like famous authors, for example, Sarah J. Mass has the same style and writing size, etc., on different books in the same series to make a sort of pattern. For this author brand, it's up to the author, provided all the books in your one series look the same. Um, and they're related in the same genre, then between series, if they're as long as they're in the same genre, yeah, you can make them the same if you make it your brand, or you can just do whatever suits the cover. It doesn't honestly matter. It's, you, you want to be thinking about, will this change whether someone buys my book? Uh, if the answer's no, then it doesn't really matter. Uh, so do what you feel is right. If you want to keep them the same, great, keep them the same, um, as long as they fit that genre and you're not writing, say, romance and sci-fi, uh, which have different text requirements, um, then, yeah, keep them the same. Um, if not, that's fine too. So, the next slide. Uh, these ones all relate to genre. So, question one, how is it, how important is it to fit in with current market trends? Uh, vital, as you've seen. Um, question two, should Book covers always be of the same kind, like should we make our book cover similar to what others are doing in the same genre so that we could market better? Um, as I've said, your cover has to show your genre, and by doing this, you're gonna fit in with other covers in the genre because you're all trying to sell and show that same genre. And that's what tells a reader it's for them. So you're gonna find that yes, they will look alike. Once you've worked out your five items, the very, very least important one could be changed. Maybe you go with purple text instead of, you know, white text or something. Um, but you get the idea. It's look at those five things and stay within your genre. So question three, is it okay to take inspiration from other covers in your market? So 
you can take inspiration, I mean, that's what you're doing with this research. Uh, create yourself a mood board of covers that are selling, look at the similarities, um, find out what sells. Uh, what you cannot do is be inspired by one or possibly two covers and end up with a cover that looks like a copy. That is a big no. But there's no reason that you can't take, you know, 10, 15 covers and go, oh, look, they've all got the girl, single girl from knees up and so on. That's taking inspiration. So question four. Sorry, I'm going through this quite fast. Are there any rules for covers that you shouldn't ignore while trying to stand out? So the rules you shouldn't ignore is good design practice, getting your cover tropes done, good topography, a clean thumbnail, and all these things a professional designer will deliver on anyway, so you shouldn't need to worry about it. Question five, how do you know the equilibrium between too much and too little on a cover, and is there such a thing? Uh, yes, there is very much such a thing. Uh, you need that thumbnail clean, too much cloudies it, and you end up with a kind of messy, not really viewable thumbnail, and too little, hmm. unless you have like, you know, blank back background with white text, there really isn't such a thing as too little. It just matches your genre, like I've gone through with the research, and you'll be fine. Um, six, finding a good font. Uh, again, fonts, they have to match your genre. Do your research, know what fonts are in your genre, what style of fonts are in your genre, make yours the same. Uh, question seven, how do I create a book cover that is both unique and eye-catching? Um, that's the job of a professional. They know how to stretch those cover tropes without breaking them uh, to make it unique, but they also know how to make it eye-catching because the cover tropes are what make it eye-catching. That is what the readers are looking for because they know what sells on a cover that is on a story they like. Uh, so, um, next slide, <laughs> question four. These are all related to romance. Um, are fantasy romance covers with a man's bare chest or some other revealing imagery still more marketable? And since one and two tie together, uh, question two, how to make clear your novel is a romance story and mix genres with fantasy or thriller without putting a half-naked body on the cover? Um, well, it depends on whether you're talking pure fantasy romance or paranormal romance. Uh, Manchester covers are really only seen in paranormal romance, not fantasy romance. Um, the revealingness of things like a bare chest under armor or a woman's legs or abs is part of the cover trope that tells readers how much steam is in a story. So it's not so much better whether it sells, it's more whether it communicates your story better. If you have high steam, you need some Manchester, some bare thighs, some uh, bare abs, whatever works for your genre. Um, if you have low steam, clothe your characters. Uh, for mid-steam, maybe a tank top on a woman. So a little bit of skin, but not too much. It tells the reader what's in your book. Um, doing the opposite, just because it sells better, is going to end up, as before, with bad reviews because you attracted the wrong readers. Um, so another thing that communicates um, the amount of steam is a character's pose. Sweet, tender, loving poses can show low esteem, while more a sort of more romancy thing, whereas more aggressive, possessive poses are the higher steam. Um, characters intertwined shows what they'll be doing in the book. Characters not touching, um, maybe that's a enemies to lovers kind of story, uh, maybe it's not steamy, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing we need to go into very briefly is Amazon is cracking down on the high steam images, as you know, uh, with AMS at the moment. So the trend for super high steam stories is now to do what's called a discrete cover, which is a symbol cover rather than a character one. So you will see that trend if that's what you write, and therefore you know you need to go towards a symbol cover rather than a character cover. So the next question, let's say I'm writing fantasy romance that isn't spicy, but it isn't cozy. How would you convey it? Most romance covers I see tend to swing wildly one way or another. Would it be better in that case to go for a cover that focuses more heavily on the fantasy aspects? Mixed genres with romance, um, put some swirly text on. Uh, swirly text typically indicates a romance subplot. If there's steam, like I said, you want, um, you know, man chest, uh, thighs, whatever it is. However, if it's just romance with your other genres, then keep them clothed. Uh, give it the swirly text, maybe some 
rose petals on the top, they typically come on romance, flowing fabric, windswept hair, anything that makes it look wistful, that shows the romance without, you know, having to be undressed. Um, so, on to the next slide. These all relate to illustrated covers. I will say up front, illustration is not something I do. I do not know the full illustration this is. Um, so it is not my area of expertise. Um, but the questions are, for fantasy and romance, many authors have their hearts set on illustrated covers, but those tend to have a higher price tag. In your experience, is it worth it to save and wait? Or have you noticed any meaningful difference in book sales with illustrated covers versus photo manipulated? Um, they do have a higher price tag. Again, it comes down to genre, including subgenre. Uh, some genres need illustration, um, and some cannot work with an illustrated cover. So do your research, know your genre and your subgenre. Um, if you're in a genre that is mostly full is fully illustrated, then the best thing you can do is wait and afford to hire someone. Um, as I've already said, don't go somewhere super affordable like Fiverr and expect to get a fully illustrated cover that hasn't been stolen um, or copied because you know it, it's someone's time they are not going to give you for five or even twenty dollars something that takes them say a week worth of work to do uh, without them having copied it from somewhere it just doesn't happen um, if your genre doesn't require illustration you might find some covers in there that can, uh, that can manage it um, with 3D modeling and illustration over the top. Um, like in, say, Lit RPG, a lot of the covers are illustrated, but you can get away with DAS 3D and illustration because you can make it look game like. Um, and a lot of the top covers use that instead of just full illustration. So it, it depends on your subgenre. Um, for fantasy romance, however, there are plenty of photo-based covers or symbol covers that sell really well. So do your research. Um, that's really all you can do. So question two, is there a risk a painted book cover may be assumed to be YA or new adult regardless of art style, or will it be correctly judged as an adult if it's a realistic art style and painted to suit the mood? Um, so there's different styles of illustration that indicate the genre. Um, as I said, I don't know huge amounts about illustration, but if you look at YA, like say Rick Riordan's series, it looks very, very different from um, an illustrated cover. Sorry, he's um, middle grade. But if you look at YA, middle grade, new adult, they look very different from something like Patricia Briggs's series, which is an adult, fully illustrated cover. Um, I couldn't explain how they look different because I don't know enough about pure illustration, but I can tell that they look different as I'm sure you guys can. So readers will know what the look of those covers they like, you know, look like. So question three, how do hand painted covers fare comparing sales towards photo manipulated covers? Um, again, depends on the genre. If you put a photo manipulated cover on, say, a three to six year old children's fiction book, it's not going to perform. However, if you put a fully illustrated cover into a contemporary romance book, it's not going to perform either. So it's a case of knowing your genre and doing your research. Um, that's all there is to it. At the end of the day, that's the single biggest thing you can do as an author is understand what sells in your genre. So last slide. Um, these questions all relate to making your own covers. What kind of f software should I use? Photoshop is the gold standard. You could try Canva. I've never used it. Um, Infinity, Affinity is another alternative that's slightly cheaper. It's not as advanced, but it's apparently easy to use. I had to ask people for these. Um, Photopea is free. GIMP is free, not as user-friendly. Krita is free, but geared towards illustration and Procreate. Um, I use Photoshop, um, so yeah. Uh, question two, what are the best resources and methods for making your own cover if you want to publish something like Wattpad? The single best thing you can do is buy a pre-made. Um, you can learn design, it takes several years, um, and you can you know, set aside the writing, learn design, and do it that way. Great, if you happen to already know the design, then awesome, do your research. Um, know what's in your genre and create it. Um, three, K 
can we make our book covers ourselves without knowing many basics or can we learn those things to make them ourselves if we can't pay or we're underaged? Uh, as I said, you can, it will take time. Um, we're talking a year or more, not weeks, if you want to learn to do something marketable. You'll need to do it full time and you'll probably have to pause on the writing to get there. Um, it's also going to be genre dependent. If you're in a genre where a single photo with some good text won't hurt your sales too much, then you know you might get up to speed very quickly and you have a lot less to learn. Uh, if you're in a genre that requires full illustration, you've got a long road ahead of you. Um, and the same with some of the fantasy genres. The, the magic is almost always illustrated, um, as is the hair. And even professionals struggle at the beginning to learn how to do those. So get yourself on some design courses. Um, I've probably spent about three grand so far on courses, and I have a massive list for ones I want to do in the future. Um, you'll have to learn things like principles of design, how to use Photoshop, how to understand topography, which is another thing that trips up a lot of even professionals, um, how it works on a cover, the overall composition and size, layout of a book cover requires something that's very different to even what most, most professional concept artists do. And even they struggle to make a book cover just because of how it's constrained and what you can and can't do on a cover to make it readable at thumbnail because that's not where a concept artist is focused. Um, so your image has to work for at thumbnail size, possibly in black and white, in less than a third of a second to convey that genre and get someone to go, oh, that looks interesting, and click. That takes skill, and it skill takes a while to learn. So if you're still wanting to do it yourself, um, maybe start looking into 3D. Um, again, that gets expensive. I've spent well over 7,000 so far on assets um, in DAS and Blender. Um, the, object, the, the software itself is free, but the objects are paid for. Um, so you have to purchase them. So you want to budget for that as well. Um, the same goes with stock images and fonts. Again, I'm well over two grand invested into those kind of things as well. So you might actually not be saving yourself much money trying to do your cover yourself. And you might end up with a cover that isn't going to sell your book either. But if you want to go for it, be my guest. Um, question uh, number four. Any advice on how to mix colors? Um, look through YouTube videos for an art course. It's the only thing I can tell you, really. Um, question five, is there any meaning in shapes or that only works with colors and are those meanings universal or do they change from culture to culture? There's totally meaning in shapes. Um, it is uh, cross-cultural and you'll see this in a lot of like Disney movies and things. Circular is friendly. If you get a nice um, hedgehog and curl them up into a circle, they're cute and friendly. And if they um, like flatten out and you can see the triangular uh, shapes of the spines, they become dangerous. So circle is friendly, square is dependable, which is why you'll see the superheroes in Disney have a very square face. Uh, and triangular is dangerous. So again, you know, you'll see the villains, they have a triangular shape to them big shoulder pads, tiny little hips, um, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm through all the questions that I had. So if you want to give me a lot from the um, chat, that would be awesome if you're still there. <laughs> Apologies, the system audio wasn't recorded, so I'm going to read out the questions. Question. We often feel that tropes easily run into the danger of being too much in stories themselves. Do you feel covers can easily do that as well when it comes to including tropes or is the danger to be too on the nose less there the case with a cover from Cena? I, th I think I understand that. I think what you want to do with a cover is be as glaringly obvious about the tropes as possible. It's you can't be too tropey. There's no such thing on a cover design as too tropey. Basically, think about when you're, sell when you're searching for a book. You go into Amazon, you type in what you want, you press go, and you get a massive list of books, and you start scrolling. How many of those covers do you see per second? Five, six? 
it's got to nail those tropes to jump off the page and it's got to be really well designed so that thumbnail is super clear so that you know that's a person that's a, mo a wolf that's a moon and so on at the thumbnail size and you, it's got to attract you uh, before you scroll past so you've got a fraction of a second so the more tropey you are the more likely it's going to attract the right reader so i don't think there is anything as uh, there is no way to be too tropey on a cover as such um i i understand what you mean in a story yeah there is too much you can just you know be going certainly down a trope story and it can be like well i know exactly what's coming next there's no surprise why am i reading kind of thing but on a cover that's not the case because you spend a long time in a book you spend a fraction of a second on a cover so you've got to nail that trope so hopefully that answers the question how do you determine what the order of importance is for your genre is it mainly just trying to compare and research what's currently at the top of the charts for the genres your story falls under from chi how do you determine what are the most important things in your genre? Is it all just looking at what's selling and cross-checking the elements that are in everything and most prominent? From J.W. Ben, I'm trying to figure out how to word this when you determine what type of cover you're going for, how much room for experimentation is there, like the tropes, but also adding new elements that may not jive specifically with what's going on in your genre. J.W. Ben. It's a case of collecting your evidence, collect your mood boards, like I said, do it in Pinterest so that you can keep looking at them. And if all of them, like say vampire covers, they're all red. So you know that one has to be the most important. Um, the most important one will typically jump off the page. They are all something. So they're all that color. They are all um, that background with like, you know, high sky rise. Um, buildings in the back for urban fantasy they are all fully illustrated for um, whatever the genre is uh, they are all vector art for cozies um, etc they are there's something that they are all that is your number one most important thing that is the number one thing you cannot change on your cover um, the next one one well, the next two or three probably they're going to it's going to be a bit personal dependent. You know, some, some people will think, you know, one is possibly more important than the other, but you've got the idea that they're sort of one of those three in the middle. Um, some genres, it will be more obvious, some will, because they are very, very strict, like urban fantasy. Um, you will not know because you have to nail all five or it's not an urban fantasy book. Um, but there are other genres where it's a bit looser, where well, some, like say Lit RPG, there are some illustrated covers, some 3D covers, um, but the content is always the same in Lit RPG. The most important thing they all have is they all have some kind of battle scene or that kind of thing. The, the characters readying for battle, in battle, or just finished battle. They've all got that sort of look to them. Um, but some of them are illustrated, some of them are... Um, 3D, um, very few of them are photo manipulation, but those other two. Um, and then the next one, when you look at the text, you've got some that are serif, some that are sans serif. So that one really isn't important. So when you're looking at your collection of things, what's the thing that you see the least consistency in? Like you've got 50-50 on the two choices. That's probably your fifth most important thing and where you could change. Um, so it is... It is tough to know exactly which order, but it's a case of like, just keep looking at your genre and thinking, okay, I've ordered my five like this. Now, what if I came out with a cover that had number one, had number two, but changed on um, number three? Would that ruin it? And I wouldn't know what genre it is anymore. Um, and then you look at number two and say, would that ruin it if I changed it? And if one is more important than the other because yes you wouldn't know what genre it was if you changed that then move that one up the scale um, <laughs> this is why it takes a designer so long to understand a genre fully <laughs> so i'm hoping that answers the question it is a case of just going through it time and time again and thinking well if i changed this would that 
still show the genre or would it not show the genre and if so that one is more important than this one. Series tend to have covers that fit each other. You can see from the covers that the books belong together. If your part one didn't do well, is it a bad idea to try something totally different but still fitting with the genre, with the cover of a part two or part three etc in an effort to find new readership? Sina. You do want your series to look like a series because people who've bought book one are going to have an expectation of what book two should look like. And again, it is genre dependent. As I said, in Lit RPG, the series books tend to look nothing alike, but that's what the readers expect. Um, whereas in other genres, they do look alike and it's very obviously a series. Um, so in a series where they do look alike, I would start examining why book one did not do as well. Um, the cheapest thing to change is your blurb. So start experimenting with your blurb. See if you can get more readers as you change your blurb. Um, there's plenty of um, Facebook groups, and I'm sure in here you've got the same thing. People will give you feedback on blurbs. So start trying you know, to improve your blurb. See if that fixes it. Um, play with your price. Um, see if you can um, persuade some of the people on your uh, newsletter to give you a review. I know you can't, like ask for a review in return for something but there's nothing to say you can't ask for a review so put a, a an email out saying you know I could really use some new reviews if you like my book please do so um, see you might get some um, so I try every every other thing that you can try before you start changing the cover because the cover costs you to change and nothing else does um, if at the end of the day it comes down to the fact your cover is a problem then yeah change it and I wouldn't match book two to it. Um, have a look, see if it's got your tropes on. Um, if it isn't meeting the tropes that you need, then that's what you need to do. I have, <coughs> excuse me, I've been hired before to change book one of a series because it was actually doing pretty well. It was in the bestseller list at the time, but I could see things that were wrong with it and they wanted to try something else and we put the new cover up that nailed the trope and we literally doubled their sales um, within a week. So it can make a massive difference, but I would try every single other thing you can try first and make sure that everything else is on point before you have to spend more money on another cover. Do swirly fonts typically convey romance, fantasy romance, and will people run the risk of being thrown off if the font is only kind of swoopy as opposed to what I think of as vampire fonts? Or is that also where the cover art itself comes in, Chi? The cover artwork and the cover topography need to work together. They are, and this is where you'll find like your um, concept artists struggle because they haven't understood topography usually um, to know how it has to work together. Um, you've got two focal points on your cover, your focal point in your artwork and your focal point of your topography and the two need to communicate and work together and lead from one to the other because that's what, how, you, how the eye moves around it. Um, part of which font to pick, so whether it's you know not, swamp, not swoopy enough or stabby enough or whatever it is, part of that will be in your genre and you'll, you'll find that in your research. You will find multiple covers in your genre all use the same font and you'll start to recognize that font and so on and you'll want to use that same font um, like paranormal women's fiction pretty much 90 percent of the covers have desire pro on them um, and it's a super versatile font so it can look very different but they've all got it <laughs> so you'll find in your genre there will be a certain three four maybe five different fonts that just get used over and over and over again so just use, use that. It's what the reader expects. It's one of the tropes. Um, so just go with it. Um, that's probably the best thing I can do uh, to say to you is, you know, that's the best way to find the right font is to see what fonts are selling. Um, so yeah, if you've got Vampire 1, usually in a vampire story, they're fairly romantic. Um, so there's usually a fair amount of swirlies. But yeah, just... Look in your genre and see what works for your genre. For folk looking to get into pre-made cover making, 
What with stock sites and the like, is it a large jump financially to step into it? And the second question, not sure if this is related enough for a question, but is there any advice for an author who's already a professional artist and is interested in making their own covers and topography? Chi. Okay. Um, best thing you can do, do your research, study your genre, work out which genre you want to do, start with one. Um, pick the one you are most drawn to and study it with what I've gone through so that you know what will sell a cover, uh, what will sell a book. Um, because pre-mades, as I said before, have to be super tropey. So you have to nail those tropes. Um, so you have to know what they are to be able to nail them. Um, then after that, learn about topography. That's probably the biggest thing that trips most new designers up. Most, most new designers have come from a background of art and therefore they've never really done topography. So, you know, get yourself in some courses that teach you about topography. Um, start getting into, there's Facebook groups out there that will give you feedback on covers from other designers and start doing it. Um, there are courses, not many I have to say, but there are courses out there. Um, get onto them, get feedback and take that feedback. Don't just go, oh, well, they're wrong. Um, if it's someone who, who knows what they're talking about, take that feedback and learn from it. Um, get into finding the top covers in your genre and if you don't know how they do something, try and recreate that cover. Now you cannot sell this, obviously. This is just for your personal work, but it's a great way to learn. Try and recreate the cover and see how they did things. How did they make the text look like that? And then you've got that skill that you can use on a cover somewhere. Um, so look at what is selling books so that you're super tropey, know that one genre, get your website up, start you know, building your list. Um, maybe you wanna do a giveaway. I know I did a few giveaways at the beginning um, and I had a few people like, you know, here's a pre-made cover and you get a few people joining a list to get the pre-made cover. Um, and start doing that and just do everything you can to make those covers sell books because that's how you can help that author so much more than anything else you know uh, it's great you know you need to be able to communicate you need to be able to you know have your business in order etc but the biggest thing you can do art wise is to nail those tropes on those covers because that's what's going to help your your clients the most do I get any kind of guarantee that I won't have issues with a bought image? Escorita Novata? Apologies if I've mispronounced that. Um, it probably should be in the designer's like terms and conditions or their contract or something. What I personally do, I know it's in my um, terms and conditions that I state that I, I use or licensed fonts, etc. And when I sell a cover, whether it's a pre-made or a custom, doesn't matter. Um, pre-made usually once they've altered the text, because then I've got the title of the, cut of the um, book. But I deliver a Word doc with links to all the image parts that I've used off of, you know, wherever, deposit photos, wherever, all the bits that I've created myself in 3D um, and all the fonts and all their links to all of their licenses so that if someone wants to go ahead, you know, wh whatever I use is always going to be fine for a book cover, but some people then want to go and merchandise and stuff and you need different licenses from deposit photos for those image bits and stuff. So I give people all the links to where they can go read the licenses for all the bits that I've used in that cover. Um, so they can work out what they need to buy extended licenses for if they want to merchandise and stuff. Um, basically, my thought was, I don't want to hold an author hostage because they don't know what font I've used and they're too scared to ask me. I want them to know exactly what's in their cover. They know they're covered and they know that, you know, if something happens to me or something, um, that they know what font is there. Um, you know, it seems only... To me, that's just business. Um, I wouldn't want it as an author the other way around, so why should I make them have it the other way around? So that's what I do. I would think the majority of um, cover designers, if you ask, they'll tell you. Um, 
And I know that everyone on the cover designer directory, that is one of the things that they look at is your policies to vet you. So every single designer on that cover designer directory.com is going to be using licensed images and, and fonts, you know, the whole lot. So if you're super worried about it, I'd go there. Um, and yeah, yeah. I know it's in my FAQ as well. I mean, it should be on the person's website. If you have a good look around, you should be able to find that they are using licensed material. Um, I think occasionally I get an author who requires that I use a font that is free. Um, and I give them the spiel of like, you know, this is not a good idea, et cetera, et cetera. But if they're still insisting on it, I say, fine, but it's completely down to you. Uh, this has nothing to do with me. I have advised you this is a bad idea, but if you want to do it, then that's fine. Um, but I've only had that once in my entire career. So, you know, <laughs> I would trust your designer if they're saying something's a bad idea and then don't do it. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're very welcome and thank you for all the thank yous. Um, and yeah, anytime you've got a question, just let me know. I'll be on, well, I'm on the, obviously on this server, but I'm also on the book cover market if you want to come in there and say hi. Um, we do run occasional events in there, uh, pre-made events and things. Um, and we have a whole category on pre-mades that are broken down channel by genre. So you can browse through uh, pre-mades in your genre. And there are a whole range of prices. Um, two of the uh, designers who are admins with me, there's four admins. Two of them are at the very top of their game and they are... I think about a thousand dollars for a pre-made um, so and then we range right down I think our minimum is 120 you're not allowed to list a cover below 120 um, so that we don't end up with people who are just sort of trying to be a cover designer rather than actually being a cover designer um, but again if you want someone who is vetted uh, you know they are professional you know that they have got the right things in place for their business like licensing and so on then go to the cover designer directory and um yeah <laughs> if you if you're interested in talking to me i do fantasy pretty much all subgenres of fantasy and paranormal with paranormal women's fiction and paranormal romance so love to talk to you <laughs> no it's not i mean if you've put you know sort of six months or a year or whatever into your book it's the least you can do is make sure it sells and the biggest thing you can do to get it to sell is to get people to your sales page because it isn't going to sell if they never land on your sales page so the cover is responsible for that as you now know cool and um before we go for the april the 9th what i have i have three other designers coming in i have um S.J. Fowler, who specializes in urban fantasy and paranormal romance. I have Sarah Waits, who does a lot of different fantasy ones. She does a bit of illustration, not full illustration, but she does a lot more illustration than the rest of us. And she does some uh, romance as well. Um, and then I have uh, um, Jamie Dalton, who is very big on uh, TikTok, in case you know Magnetra on TikTok. And she is specializes in high fantasy and epic fantasy. Um, and she does a few other things. And she is excellent at spotting trends in the market. She is probably the best I've ever seen at spotting trends in the market. And uh, the four of us form a mastermind. Um, and uh, so we know each other really well so any covers that do get sent in we are going to have a look at beforehand so that we can make sure the right person is giving you feedback on them so if you've got a cover you want feedback on please do send them in and the four of us will look at them discuss them and then we'll be better prepared for you on the ninth awesome and thank you so much for listening as well <laughs>